it's a great pleasure to be here um, today, not only to be back to my second home um, again, um, but also to be part of this, what one would call a groundbreaking um, workshop for acting judges. I've already been pointing out uh, to the Judicial College in the UK, which is responsible for our training and of which I'm a fellow now, that they too should be doing, um, in their very good induction course for fee-paid judges, they should also be doing a spot on judicial ethics, which they don't presently do. That was the oath I took when I was sworn as a High Court um, judge. This is the oath that you took when you were sworn as acting judges, and I'm assuming you did all take the oath when you were sworn in as acting judges. But I wonder this, were you provided with a copy of the code as you've just been provided for here? No? No. I wasn't provided with a copy of the judicial code when I was sworn in, and indeed I wasn't shown the card beforehand, literally I was handed the card in the Lord Chief Justice's court, an absolutely packed court, swore the oath, didn't think about it really, not given the code of ethics, which incidentally had only just come out in 2004. The oaths aren't dissimilar when you look at them. What one has to say to oneself is, what does it all mean? Well, I mean, a judge's obligation to administer justice in accordance with the Constitution and the law, that's pretty obvious, isn't it? It means you choose, you, you decide the law on the law and not your version or what you think the law ought to be. The judge's duty to administer uh, justice to all persons alike without fear, favor, or prejudice is pretty comprehensive. And that's what Lord Bingham um, said of that. And he was trying a modern paraphrase of, of it. And he said, a judge must free himself of prejudice and partiality and so conduct himself in court and out of it as to give no ground for doubting his ability and willingness to decide cases coming before him solely on their legal and factual merits as they appear to him in the exercise of an objective, independent and impartial um, judgment. And in a way that really doesn't need much elaboration. We have to ask the question, what conduct do we, do we expect of judges and why? Well, why is pretty obvious, is it, is it not? Um, no one can be in any doubt that an independent and impartial um, judiciary is the bedrock of a democratic society. And I hope at this stage that I'm not offending one of the don'ts of Justice Nugent, because we, we hear that, the bedrock of a democratic society, that's something that is said very often. But the judiciary is central to preserving the rule of law. It's important that we approach the job um, with that independence and impartiality that is really part of our DNA. Now, what do we expect of judicial um, office holders? Now, I'm going to go back as far as um, 1660, Lord Chief Justice Hale, because I really think, and it reads so beautifully as well, that in the execution of justice, I carefully lay aside my own passions and not give way to them however provoked that I be wholly intent upon the business I'm about, remitting all other cares and thoughts as unseasonable an interruption, that I suffer myself, not myself, to be prepossessed with any judgment at all till the whole business and both parties be heard, that I never engage myself in the beginning of any cause, but reserve myself unprejudiced till the whole um, the herd. A lot of countries, if you look across the world now, most countries have got some kind of code of um, judicial um, conduct. It's important to note in the preamble of your code of um, conduct that it emphasizes the need for the judiciary to conform to standards, ethical standards that are generally um, accepted, and in particular the Bangalore uh, principles of judicial uh, conduct. So it behoves you as a minimum to be aware not only of your code of conduct, but also um, those of the Bangalore principles. And the principles are there. There's six values in the Bangalore principles. Independence, impartiality, integrity, 
propriety, equality, competence, and diligence. Now, these are guidelines to provide guidance for judges and to provide a framework for judges in relation to judicial conduct. They're also, because they're, they're not just for judges, they're also for the wider public to understand uh, the guidance and the rules for judges, and also the executive and the legislature and the lawyers uh, when you're wearing your legal lawyer's hat. And it's there for a people to understand what is expected um, of the judiciary. I'm going to very briefly just mention some codes of other jurisdictions. The reason I do is because there's a provision in your code um, that it is sometimes helpful to look at the codes of other jurisdictions um, when considering ethical matters. And so I'm just going to uh, name some of them for you. I haven't got time to go through in any detail as to how they're set out and how they differ from your code. But I think it, it, it's important just to um, draw your attention to some of them. You've got the Canadian uh, ethical principles for judges, very similar to the Bangalore principles, which has headings, statements, and accompanying uh, principles. The important thing about the Canadian um, code is that it doesn't purport to amount to a code as such um, or a list of prohibited behaviours, uh, and nor does it set out the standards which define judicial uh, misconduct. That, that's the approach the Canadians take. The ABA model code of judicial conduct um, sets out guidance in four simple canons with accompanying rules. Now, I use the word rules because that, in contrast to the Canadian model, um, apart from being a guide to assist judges in maintaining standards of judicial and personal conduct, is also the basis for regulating judges through disciplinary um, agencies. So there's a distinction there. The English Code of Judicial Conduct is very much like the Canadian one. It's just a guide. It has commentary under seven headings, independence, impartiality, integrity, propriety, competence and diligence, personal relationships and perceived bias, activities outside court and retirement. And that's very much, as I said, it's a guide and it's not the basis for disciplinary um, proceedings. The Australian Code of Judicial Conduct is a very practical document, and it's one that I suggest that if you have time that you download, um, because the aim of the publication is to give practical guidance to members of the Australian um, judiciary. And it recognises that our, there are a range of reasonably held opinions on different situations, and that's why it aims to be um, very practical in the guidance that it gives. And I very much um, recommend um, that you download a, a, a copy of that because it's very helpful from a practical point of view. I if you're very interested in um, looking at other codes, in particular from the Commonwealth countries, you can always get um, a copy of those codes from the Commonwealth Judges and Magistrates um, Association. You can go online and and um, see what's uh, there. Now, your code of conduct <coughs> is divided into articles which set out the principles. The principles are accompanied by notes of guidance. So we have judicial independence, to act honorably, compliance with the law, equality, transparency, fair trial, diligence, Restraint, association, recusal, extrajudicial activities of judges on active service, extrajudicial income, reporting inappropriate conduct, and judges discharged from active um, service. Now, the fact that there are more headings in your code does not mean that the other codes have missed things out. It just means that you've divided some of those um, common principles into um, separate headings. The, 
There is section 12.5, section 14.4b of the Judicial Service Commission Act 1994, um, which sets out the provisions about the code that it serves as the prevailing standard judicial conduct which judges must adhere to and that any willful or grossly negligent breach of the code may amount to misconduct which will lead to disciplinary action. So what we're seeing there is a code which is rather akin to the American, um, the ABA uh, model code because it's setting out quite clearly that you will be subject to disciplinary action um, uh, it, for breach of the code. Um, but beware of Article 3.2c of the code because what it says is the code must not be interpreted as absolute, precise or exhaustive. Conduct may therefore be unethical, which on a strict reading of the code may appear to be permitted, and the converse also um, applies. And that's really, really important indeed. Because it's not in the code, doesn't mean that you've got a let out clause, basically. And I think that's something you have to be very clear about. Subsection three, and I didn't, I didn't copy that for you, um, deals with the international standards to which I've all, all already alluded. In other words, what they're saying is, um, although international codes and standards aren't directly applicable, they can be useful in those sort of cases where your code doesn't cover that type of situation. So that's where the sort of international aspect um, comes into it. The principle that I'm going to focus on um, now is that of impartiality. Now it says unconscious bias, and there's um, a, a reason for that. You remember Justice Brand said yesterday um, when he was talking about assessing credibility and was saying be very careful about it, especially, you know, um, demeanour uh, and things of that nature. So what, what will follow has some relevance to his words of caution um, there. Because something that we don't think about very often in everyday life and something that we as judges ought to think about more, uh, I think, is this issue of confronting what your own prejudices are. I've only just started doing work on unconscious bias, and that is because I was asked to do so by the Chief Justice of Trinidad and Tobago. We don't do it in the UK. Now I'm doing it. Um, the Judicial College is saying, oh my goodness, we should be doing this but we haven't done it in the UK. I've started doing work on it and I've been asked to do more work on it because it's actually fascinating. I think even as lawyers, you know, when you're making assessments of things and you make assessments of your clients um, quite often and you have to make access assessments of cases and things, we just do it without thinking about it. But actually sometimes you need to stand back and just have a thought about how your thought processes have got to where um, they are. Your code says um, that a judge must at all times in the performance of judicial duties refrain from being biased or prejudices. And Article 9a little 2 states that a judge must remain manifestly impartial. Now what I want to deal with is the not so manifest and that's the issue of unconscious um, bias. I'm going to give you a little story against myself um, that, that happened just to sort of give you an idea of what I'm getting at. I went on circuit, one of my first circuits, I went out on circuit um, to the north of England and the judges in the um, judges' dining room were complaining about a particular council. All of them were complaining about her, saying she looks awful, she's dreadful, she's this, 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 this. And, and I was saying to them, well, if she doesn't, if she's not dressing properly, and she's got long hair and it's all over the place, you know, just remind her of, you know, her duties under the code of conduct. Women have to have their hair tied back in the UK under their, their wigs. And the judge was saying, oh, no, no, we can't do that. You know, we'll get, we'll get, you know, accused of harassment or something like that. And I was saying, stop being so wet. Anyway, I finished, <laughs> I finished my, I had six weeks there. 
and I finished my case in five weeks, and so I had a week to spare. Didn't want to go back to London, so I said I'd do some of the smaller cases um, at court there. And guess what? The first case, who turns up but that particular counsel that all the judges had been complaining about. And it is true to say that she looked as if she'd gone through a hedge backwards. <laughs> her bands were all sticking out of her suit. Her hair was all over the place, stick it, you know, with her, her wig sort of um, hovering on, on the top. <laughs> and we got through the first day of the trial. She was defending. And I became so fixated on the way she looked and what the judges had told me, because they'd really prejudiced me uh, against her. And I was probably distinctly um, cool whenever I had to address her um, about something. And it came to the end of the day, and I thought, if I'm thinking like this, and not although I was taking a note, because I, I used to use my computer in court, so I was mechanically taking a note of the evidence, but actually not listening to the evidence, because I was so fixated by counsel. And I thought, if I'm like that, what are the jury thinking? The same thing's probably happening with the jury, that they, they've taken a ginner, because they think she looks unprofessional, they're not listening to her cross-examination, her client's case or anything, and this is not good for justice. So I was a bit of a coward, but I asked my clerk, who was a lovely chap and did it, I knew, much better than I would have done it, um, to have a word with counsel and just remind her about the, the relevant paragraph in the Code of Conduct about, about dress and pulling your hair back and everything. The next day she came into court, hair back, looked really professional, bands, you know, inside the suit, carried on the trial, and it became clear to me that actually she was a very good advocate indeed. But her client's case was being prejudiced because of this distraction. But it was, it was a lesson to me at how easy, easily one can become prejudiced and hold something against a person and therefore not listen because you've already formulated an idea and have a view about that person. And that was a very, very salutary lesson to me um, about this sort of aspect. So that's really where I'm going to um, and getting at when I talk about um, unconscious bias. What is bias? Well, there you have it. That's the Oxford English Dictionary definition. An inclination, leaning, bent, predisposition towards predilection or prejudice. Everyone has biases. It's part of our flight or fight instinct. It's involved in the processing of our everyday actions and it serves a purpose. So if you say, I'm unbiased, I don't have biases, you're wrong, you do, they're there. We make decisions about what is safe and what is not. And this has been called the danger detector. Scientists estimate that we are exposed to as many as 11 million pieces of information at any one time. I mean, it's, it's unbelievable when you think about it. And our brains can only process about 40 um, at a time. There's also a distinction between our conscious mind and our unconscious brain. And the unconscious brain, this is the important part, is processing and sifting about 200,000 times more information than the conscious um, mind. We develop a perceptual lens that filters out some things and lets in others depending on certain perceptions, interpretations, preferences and biases that we ourselves um, have adapted in our lives. So according to research, this natural, and I stress natural, human process of categorizing like objects together and related cognitive biases can result in an individual's implicit reliance on stereotypes. And we all do it, I'm afraid. If anybody says they don't, you're deluding um, yourself. And I think it's really important um, when we see that research tells us, in fact, that you, you may not think that you uh, do stereotypes, but actually, unconsciously, um, you do. It's been found that this can make people remember stereotype behavior that did not occur and less readily remember stereotype inconsistent behavior which did occur. And that I find very frightening indeed, but that's what the research um, has shown.
what is unconscious bias. Now, it's got all sorts of different names, as you can um, see there, but they relate to the same thing. It's a concept that individuals have a preference at a subconscious level that unintentionally influences decision-making. Unconscious bias operates at a very subtle level below our awareness. It's difficult to detect, but it results in almost unnoticeable micro um, behaviors. Now, I asked when I was in the Caribbean, I asked the, <coughs> the, the judges, I gave them this hypothetical scenario. I'd invited them. They, I knew they were in holiday, one or two of them on holiday in London. I said, okay, I said, um, you know, why don't you come to a um, uh, reception that uh, some judges are going to be at so you can meet some of the English judges? But I said, imagine the situation, I'm late. You walk into this reception, and it's a room full of mainly white men, but some white women, and a couple of um, black judges. Where will you go? Guess what they said. They, made a, they would make a straight beeline to the black judges because they would feel comfortable there. I did a similar thing with tall people. The tall people, same scenario, with the very tall people, and where would they gravitate towards somebody, you know, in a room full of people they didn't know, they, they agreed that they would gravitate towards the tall people because it's people you, you feel comfortable with, you don't know them, but you have something in common and therefore you go there by way of, of, of comfort. Summarise that because we haven't got so much time, but there are processes which are called the automatic processes of fast thinking, and then the slow thinking, thinking, the deliberate process. An awful lot of what we do is fast thinking. So we're not conscious of what we're doing, but we're doing it and thinking it and processing it whilst um, we go by our everyday lives. Fast thinking means you make decisions far more quickly, obviously, but you can make errors in them because of the unconscious bias. Slow thinking is more deliberate and therefore more reasoned and uh, rational. What does the research show? And this, <laughs> this is, again, something that one should be aware of. Because children as early as three, and this is mainly research from the States, because that's where most of the research <laughs> has been done, um, pick up terms of racial prejudice without understanding the significance of it. But then they form attachments to their own groups and thus develop negative attitudes about other groups, although they know almost nothing um, about them. Affinity bias, the mini-me syndrome. Confirmational um, bias is based on the thesis that we make decisions largely in a way that confirm the beliefs we already have. So this, un this happens unconsciously, both in good and bad ways. So, for instance, you know, talking to some of the judges, did they have an ingrained belief that unemployed people were lazy because they were unemployed and were obviously um, not making an effort to um, get a job? If you had somebody charged with shoplifting, with theft, and they're unemployed, do you think subconsciously that might affect your approach to their evidence in the sense of down... Down below in your gut, you're thinking, well, they probably did because they're unemployed and they can't afford, they can't afford um, to pay for things. So those are the sort of dangers one has to be aware of. Assimilation bias is an inclination to interpret ambiguous information in a way that is consistent with previously held beliefs. Belief perseverance, that's keeping held beliefs even though you've been shown, the evidence shows that your belief is wrong. You, you just believe it so strongly, you're not going to listen to anything that contradicts um, what is said. The, I mean, th this is particularly pertinent to judging. I'll tell you why. Because if you're looking at evidence and you say, well, I choose to accept this evidence, and you'll pick on that, there is some evidence there that doesn't really support your belief, and you miss it out. So you don't really deal with it. You sort of you're silent about it and pick on what you like. That is a great danger in judging and making assessments. Argument from authority is um, that if an argument's put forward by 
somebody who's authoritative or somebody you like, that it's more likely to carry um, weight with you. Remember somebody mentioned about S, um, you know, senior counsel, um, you know, whether you should defer to arguments from senior counsel. The answer is you shouldn't, but the fact that the question's asked um, it, it is, is very much um, part of that argument from authority um, issue. Argument from novelty, because it's new, um, it must be better, a bit like iPad really, isn't it? Every version of the iPhone, it, you know, it must be better because it's the new version. There's the bandwagon bias. Argument for antiquity is the opposite. Because it's, you know, it's been there forever, it means that it's right. Bandwagon bias, we've all heard about people jumping on the bandwagon, and often people jump on the bandwagon without actually having rationally thought through why they're jumping on that bandwagon. Argument from ig ignorance, well, that's self-explanatory. Um, correspondence um, bias, that is a, um, that's a tendency to explain others' behaviours, overemphasising their personal uh, disposition and downplaying the relevance of the situation. Thinking that people perhaps break the law because they've got a criminal personality um, disregarding situational factors that may have caused them to commit the um, offence. Because they've got previous conviction, because it's a bit like that argument of because they've got previous conviction, it means they're more likely to have committed um, this offence. The gambler's fallacy is the belief that if a given outcome has not occurred for a while, then it's bound to happen um, soon. Now, if any of those sound familiar, then that's good in a way because you're acknowledging them. The bottom line is acknowledge it. Be aware um, of your possible biases. Because research has showed that we can control our unconscious bias, um, the real key is to being aware of it. So this is what I've put together. It's not scientific. It's just, it's just a bit of common sense, it seems to me, that one needs to look at. First of all, recognize that you have unconscious biases. Try and identify what those biases may be. Formulate questions related to work and answer them honestly, and that really is the key, answer them honestly. And get feedback from colleagues and staff, because it's quite interesting. I, I was doing some training of magistrates in the UK. I can't remember, it was, it was in a breakout group, and, and one, one magistrate said, well, I'm not a racist, he said. And the rest of the group said, oh, yes, you are. Now, well, there was nearly a punch-up, but that apart, um, it, he was so taken aback and upset by the feedback that he got from his colleagues because he had never thought about what he did. Nobody had ever, you know, picked him up on it. So I do say get feedback from people because that's really, really helpful indeed. Analyse your decision-making for any possible bias and remind yourself to be fair and objective because... The research has shown that if you do remind yourself uh, uh, about biases, you can do something about it. So you just remind yourself um, what you um, need to do. Article 13. A judge should recuse him or herself if there's a real or reasonably perceived conflict of interest or reasonable suspicion of bias based on objective facts, and a judge shall not recuse him or herself on insubstantial um, grounds. Now, there's some further um, uh, guidance in that article uh, on recusal, but I just want to make one or two points of general application. Each case depends on its own facts. That is um, self-evident. And a judge has to be robust in your um, decision-making. It's your decision at the end of the day and it's important to say that there is often no right or wrong um, answer, and opinions may vary, and we'll find this out when we deal with the hypothetical um, questions. But I think the starting point is with these things is always what is the test, first of all? What's the test? What, what authorities are there on the test? What do they say? And those will be your um, starting points. I think another thing is don't be afraid to take advice, especially as acting judges. There's nothing wrong in adjourning, taking a break to think about the matter and take advice. And I say take advice 
There's nothing wrong in that, but at the end of the day, you take responsibility for your own decision. You may get advice, you may disagree with it, actually. So you make your own decision. But actually, um, discussing it and knocking it around with somebody um, is often helpful to clarify your own thoughts on it. An important issue is one of disclosure. I've done a quote there from um, the Chief Justice of Australia in the case of Abner and the official trustee in bankruptcy, um, where the Chief Justice, the then Chief Justice, gave guidance on the sort of situations um, where a judge should make disclosure of interests and association. So the test seems to be there if there is a serious possibility that they are potentially disqualifying and uh, sets out some of the um, kind of situations. A and I think it's important, the issue of disclosure, that you need to think yourself sometimes whether you should be disclosing um, certain information before a case starts. So that's something you always need to look at and think about. And you can take advice on, um, of course, before the case has started. The other issue about disclosure is how much detail you give in relation to what you're going to tell people. Because obviously, if it's personal stuff, you don't really want to go into so much detail. So again, you've got to look at it and see, do I need, A, do I need to disclose? If I do need to disclose, how much detail um, do I need to give? Because it leads on to the next issue, which is the question of waiver. Because waiver, as Lord Bingham uh, had um, defined it, is a voluntary, informed, and unequivocal election by a party not to claim a right or raise an objection which is open to that party to claim or raise. Informed is the really important word. Because if you don't make sufficient disclosure, they can't make an informed decision about whether or not to say, don't worry, judge, it's fine, you can sit on this case. So it's very, very important that if there is an issue that arises, that you do work out how much you must you need to disclose in order that the parties can make informed submissions as to whether or not you should sit um, on the case. Um, because sometimes you may not know some details of the case, you give information and suddenly counsel will stand up and say, well actually, da di da di da di da di da and you see that there is some tangential um, connection that you hadn't been aware of just reading um, the papers. Timing is really important. I don't know how, how much in advance you get papers, but if it's situations where you get papers well in advance, the earlier you flag up this issue, if there is a potential issue um, of conflict, um, the better, um, of course. Proper reasons for your decision um, need to um, be uh, given. So you make your decisions, you give reasons for the decisions. That's Article 12 of your um, code. They don't need to be lengthy, but the rationale does have to be clear and it does have to be there. There's a range of opinions often. So as long as you've given your decision, your reasons are clear uh, and they're comprehensible. An appeal court is not going to be looking to destroy you. It's only if you, A, don't give reasons or your reasoning is, is so um, impaired that your um, decision, if it's a robust one, um, will be overturned. Now, I'm going to, for a little bit of right, light relief before I get you doing some work, is just give you one or two examples from um, both the UK and the US about another aspect. One of your articles talks about um, the impartiality, treating everybody um, with courtesy um, in court and not making derogatory um, comments um, uh, um, about counsel or the party. So one or two examples on how not to do it. Um, there was one, an extreme example was a long time ago, um, the senior judge at the Old Bailey was trying a case of Sikhs, uh, a big murder case, and he was giving an after-dinner speech at Mansion House, which is in the city of London. 
and he rather foolishly made mention of the case that he was trying at the, uh, at the time and referred to them as murderous Sikhs. So it was found not surprisingly that in the absence of any uh, convincing contradiction of the report, newspaper report, that there was an appearance of bias. More recently, a uh, family high court judge um, was trying a case, it was custody, and um, the father um, was um, from United uh, Arabic Emirates, I think. Um, and the judge, um, in pretrial hearing, referred to him flying off, get going off or going home on his flying carpet, and then referred to his evidence as being as gelatinous as Turkish delight. Um, the Court of Appeal, unsurprisingly, um, found that uh, his remarks were quite unacceptable and likely to cause offence and um, certainly show some bias because the judge, when it came to the full hearing, refused to recuse himself on the basis that he was perfectly able to you know, take an impartial um, view on the case. Judge Davis was publicly reprimanded for humiliating a prosecutor by calling her sneaky, treacherous, and having the compassion of an Auschwitz prison guard. It, it, it does get worse when you go through this article because it deals with all kinds of um, judicial conduct. Judge Evans intimated to a defence lawyer that she was a gangland lawyer, mouthpiece for the mob, uh, and um, as a defence attorney was making an argument in a case, Judge Shapiro cut him off and asked, "Do you know what I think? Do you know what I think of your argument, counsel?" And at which point the judge pushed a button on a device that simulated the sound of a flushing toilet. <laughs> 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 so unsurprisingly, uh, uh, they were chastised for such um, behaviour. So I'm sure it won't happen here, but um, it, it's surprising to think that things like that do happen, in fact. But there you are. It, it's, um, they are there are cases um, uh, on this.